Good evening. It's the 28th of February 1933 and you're watching News of Germany, the best independent current affairs show in the German Reich. The government has announced a new emergency decree to deal with the threat of a Bolshevist takeover. More on that later in the show. But first, for the latest updates on the fire that last night gutted the Reichstag building, I'm joined by our reporter in Berlin. Andrew, can you remind us of just what happened? Well, as you just said, the Reichstag building burned down. What, do you want details? Yes, please. All right, fair enough. Around nine o'clock yesterday evening, as you would know if you weren't living under a rock, the alarm was raised and a fire was discovered in the restaurant. Now that fire was put out pretty quickly, but other fires sprang up and quickly took hold. The blaze was so intense that firefighters actually had difficulty in keeping it under control, and they eventually put it out just after half past midnight. But by then, the debating chamber had been pretty much destroyed. So where is the Reichstag itself going to meet? Well, of course, we don't have a Reichstag at the moment because, as you well know, it was dissolved when the president called for new elections. If what you're talking about is the new Reichstag, when it forms about a week from now, it'll probably meet in the Opera House just a short distance away. Now, I understand the police actually made an arrest at the scene. Yes, he's a Dutch citizen called Marinus van der Lubbe, and he was discovered inside the building about half an hour after the alarm was first raised, and according to police, he made a confession on the spot. Now, the government apparently has accused him of being a communist revolutionary. Is there any evidence of that? Oh, finally, a good question. Well, he certainly is a committed communist. He used to be a member of the Communist Party of Holland and is now a member of an organization called the Group of International Communists. And last year, he even tried to defect to the Soviet Union. Thank you, Andrew. We have to leave it there because I'm sick of talking to amateurs. Now, the government has claimed that van der Lubbe was trying to provoke a violent uprising and in response uh, has issued the decree of the Reich president for the protection of people and state. Joining me to explain more is Professor Andrew Bossom of the Frankfurt Institute of Questionable Politics. Uh, Professor, this is the second emergency decree in less than a month. Uh, yes, yes. It's quite extraordinary. Mm. Isn't it? Mm. Mm. So, um, what does this decree do? Um, a lot. Uh, paragraph one uh, suspends several articles of the constitution, and uh, paragraph two allows the national government to override the state governments. Uh, now, that first part, uh, which articles have been suspended? Uh, every single one of the articles that the constitution allows the president to suspend. Uh, these would be Article 114, uh, which generally protects personal freedoms. Um, Article 115, uh, which guarantees the sanctity of the home. Article 117, which uh, is privacy of correspondence. Article 118, the freedom of speech. Article 123, freedom of assembly. Article 124, the freedom to form societies. And Article 153, uh, which protects private property from seizure. That is a lot of freedoms. Uh, in effect, uh, your home can now be searched uh, without any particular reason and um, anything that you have. Uh, confiscate it. The government can listen in to your telephone conversations or read your letters. Um, and uh, even political parties can now be banned. And this is all legal, is it? I actually doubt it, to be honest. I mean, apart from the sheer scope of this decree, uh, there are uh, two things that worry me. Uh, first, the government has not, in my view, demonstrated that there is any kind of uh, imminent threat to society at the moment. Um, and second, there's no definite expiry date on this decree. It just says until further notice. So are you saying that would make it unconstitutional? Uh, perhaps. 
Well, the Constitution says that uh, such a decree um, must be temporary. Now, it doesn't explicitly say that there must be a definite expiry date on it, uh, but it was never intended to allow such a decree to be quite so uh, open-ended. And on that note, Professor, thank you. And that's it. Our time is up. Uh, we will, of course, keep you updated on any further developments. But until then, thank you for watching and good night. I have a really bad feeling about this. The timing of the Reichstag fire was very convenient for the National Socialist Party. It happened on the 27th of February 1933, with elections due on the 5th of March. We still don't know for sure whether or not that was a coincidence. It is true that Marinus van der Lubbe was arrested at the scene and that he confessed to police. It is also true that he was a communist. But given the circumstances, there are a lot of questions still open. It is possible that he really did start the fire or that he was manipulated into doing so as a false flag operation. But it's also possible that he had nothing to do with the fire and his confession was forced out of him. In 1955, a former SA member stated under oath that on the night in question, he had driven van der Lubbe to the Reichstag building and that the fire had at that point already started. One theory is that van der Lubbe was given scopalamine, a psychoactive drug which can result in a loss of will. Right now, his remains are being examined to see if they can find any evidence for that. In any case, the Reichstag fire and the resulting suspension of several fundamental human rights was a major step in the Nazi takeover of Germany. And it happened just one month after Hitler had become chancellor. Van der Lubbe of attempt to... Oh. Clock yesterday evening, as you know perfectly well... Uh, <laughs>